final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 9775 in the name of Margaret McDougall on recognising the impact of loneliness on physical and mental health. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if those members who wish to contribute could press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Margaret McDougall to open the debate. Seven minutes, please. Thank you. I would like to thank the presiding officer and members across all parties for their support in bringing this debate on the impact that loneliness can have on physical and mental health to the Chamber today. I am leading this debate in my role as convener of the Volunteering and the Voluntary Sector Cross-Party Group. The CPG recently received a presentation on the issue of loneliness and its impact on health and associated financial costs from Liz Watson. Chief Executive of Befriending Networks, and I would like to thank Liz and the CPG for the support they have provided for this debate today. I would also like to thank both Macmillan Cancer Support and Sam H for the briefings that they have provided in advance of the debate. Loneliness and social isolation are complex issues. They are difficult to measure, but can affect everyone at any point in their lives as I stated in the motion before us today. 10% of people over 65 in the UK say that they are lonely or very lonely, and 20% consider themselves occasionally lonely. The recent Volunteer Scotland v Enable report states that there is a major gap in services for older people. The report suggests that this gap could be addressed by volunteering and befriending services. And I will go on to discuss this idea later in my speech. Of course, loneliness is not just an issue that affects the elderly, and studies into the association between loneliness and sociality during middle childhood and adolescence show that loneliness in adolescence is strongly associated with suicidal thoughts and behaviours, independent of gender, ethnicity or socio-economic status. In adults, loneliness can increase the risk of developing mental health problems, including depressive symptoms and obsessive compulsive disorder, and more than double a person's risk of developing dementia. Worryingly, according to Sam H, isolation is becoming more common in adults. In their Worried Sick report, one family supporter worker from Fife stated that We've also got some clients who live in a local estate and there's no services there. So that increases the feeling of isolation when people are stuck in their flat. And that lack of network or support groups just increases that feeling of isolation. This can also be said of people living in rural areas where there are very few transport links. And I'm sure some of my co colleagues will mention this today. Macmillan Cancer Support recently warned that we are on the verge of a loneliness epidemic and an estimated 60,000 people are suffering from loneliness as a result of their illness, with 31% of Scots indicating that they are lonelier since diagnosis. It's clear from the study carried out by Macmillan Cancer Support that loneliness can have a huge effect on the health and well-being of people living with cancer with those that are lonely being three times more likely to drink more and five, more, five times more likely to skip meals. Presiding officer, loneliness is a problem which can affect all of us, whether young or old, rich or poor, sick or healthy, and it can affect you at any time in your life. But people with terminal illnesses or those that are elderly can hit, be hit the hardest. So when it comes to tackling the issue, we need an all-encompassing strategy because evidence shows that tackling loneliness is crucial to meeting the national outcome for people in Scotland to live longer, healthier lives. I believe that the voluntary sector will be essential in helping us deal with loneliness and social isolation. And as stated earlier, the Volunteer Scotland v Enable report suggest that gaps in services for older people are ones that address loneliness and isolation. This could be a simple niche for volunteering. Though I would argue that we should be looking into utilising volunteering 
to address loneliness and social isolation in all age groups. Currently, it is a postcode lottery as to who can get services such as befriending. They are funded in a very piecemeal manner and there is no overall strategy within Scotland to tie everything together, hence the gaps in services. There may well be a cost associated with filling these gaps, but surely it is worth it when we consider that loneliness has a financial as well as a health cost. And befriending and similar services contribute to improving the health and well-being of the population. Through tackling loneliness and promoting social participation, we encourage healthy behaviour, such as stopping smoking, more physical activity, and it even increases the consumption of vegetables. So dealing with loneliness has far-reaching effects on improving health and well-being. Only through a strategic and coordinated response to the issue of loneliness can we maximise opportunities for such activities as befriending for isolated people in all of Scotland's communities. To conclude, presiding officer, I ask the Minister today what consideration the Scottish Government is giving to placing volunteering at the heart of our health and wellbeing policy to tackle loneliness. Because volunteering doesn't just happen, it needs to be properly supported and funded. Finally, to assist in this regard, has the Scottish Government considered including the reduction of loneliness as a Scottish Government indicator so we can measure the effects of policy? Then perhaps we will not only live longer and healthier lives, but less lonely lives too. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate and I call Mary Scanlon to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Margaret McDougall for securing this debate. And I would also like to place on record the excellent work that Margaret does as the convener of the cross-party group on volunteering. I have to say that I have kept a fairly close eye on health issues uh, since 1999, but I had never actually seen uh, any research uh, relating uh, uh, comparing loneliness to physical and mental health. Uh, and in that respect, I thank uh, Margaret McDougall for sending me the, uh, the contribution that was made at her cross-party group. And I think it's worth spelling out because it certainly shocked me. Uh, a US study found that loneliness can increase the risk of death by 10%. Well, I, I certainly didn't know that. Increases the risk of heart disease and puts people at greater risk of blood clots. Uh, loneliness estimated to be as bad for people's health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. I certainly didn't know that. Uh, I, I think one that really concerned me was um, a 2006 study of 3,000 nurses with breast cancer found that women without close friends were four times more likely to die than women with 10 or more friends. I actually found the information really, really disconcerting. As Margaret uh, McDougall has already said, around 10% of over 65 say they are lonely or very lonely, and another 20% occasionally lonely. I always thought that dementia was either genetic or whatever, but the fact that dementia almost doubles in older people who are lonely. And again, research from 2005. Well, I'm not sure that many people know that. I certainly didn't, and I'm not a clinician. And that takes us really to the gap in services for loneliness and isolation. And I know that Margaret McDougall has certainly mentioned befriending, and uh, an example was given about Concarden and Deeside befriending service, uh, befriending at hospital project, uh, and there was increased confidence of people going home in 100% of their service users, and this led to a 14% reduction in bed days lost to delayed discharge. 
So you're addressing one issue and also it's hugely cost effective. Uh, I'm sure Rhoda Grant will also mention the wonderful bef befriending service that we have in Inverness. It is run uh, by volunteers, one particular volunteer called Alan Michael, who reopened a day centre in Inverness called the Dunbar Centre. So I think that volunteering and befriending is certainly one of the issues. But what I would like to see is the information I have here, I'm happy to pass it on to the Minister, I'm not sure if uh, he has that. Um, but I would like to see all of the information from all of these research projects, whether it's about dementia, physical, mental health, recovering from cancer. I would like and I would hope that the Minister, in summing up, would bring together all aspects relating to the effect of loneliness into one piece of research and to look at the impact uh, on people's health uh, from this research. So although, as I said, volunteering is one answer, I think there are other complexities and bereavement was mentioned. And for many people who are lonely, they've had the same partner for 30, 40 or 50 years. It's then very difficult for them to suddenly go out and join a lunch club or a day centre. Uh, and I think there does need to be support for that. But I also think that uh, more could be done in terms of lunch clubs. Uh, I noticed an advert uh, last night when I was in Tesco for tea dances for over 65s. Uh, but also things like walking groups. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Uh, and the befriending service. And uh, before I uh, sum up, presiding officer, I think that we need to make, uh, although many of the council lunch clubs and uh, day centres are closing down, there are plenty of residential care homes who, you know, if people could just go in for a, just for a lunch club, you know, as a day centre, if we could make more use of the existing network that we have. But I do, I have to say, I was shocked at the information that came forward today, and I do hope that it will be taken forward in a positive manner by the Minister. Many thanks. And to now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Kenneth uh, Gibson. Officer, I'd like to congratulate uh, Margaret McDougall for bringing forward this uh, important subject for the debate this evening and also pay tribute to all the work she does in relation to volunteering because that's clearly central to dealing with the problem that uh, we're addressing today. I, at the beginning of the, or just before I should say the debate, I was kind of quietly singing Eleanor Rigby, that great Beatles song about loneliness, which probably tells you what age I am. But it does, I think, remind us that uh, you know, people have been aware of the issue and significance of loneliness in general terms for a long time. But as Mary Scanlon said, relating it particularly to physical illness, but even also to some uh, mental illnesses, is actually relatively recent, certainly uh, in research terms. And Mary Scanlon helpfully uh, mentioned some of the research reports. I'll mention just a couple, but uh, before that, just uh, let me give uh, some figures which back up what has already been said. Mental Health Foundation said 10% uh, of, of British people, this is a UK uh, figure, uh, feel lonely, and half of people think people are getting lonelier in general. And the Age Scotland figure that we've had sent to us for this debate is more than 80,000 people, 65 and over, describe themselves as often are always lonely. So we know that this affects a great many people. Now, the two studies I refer to, one by Professor John Kaki Oppo uh, of the University of Chicago, who's actually a world leading neuroscientist, although I didn't know that until this week. But he did a longitudinal study, so he was looking at a very large number uh, of people uh, over time, and he found a relationship between high levels of the, the stress hormone cortisol and time spent in isolation. And he also suggested that people in isolation were sleeping a lot less well, which may have been one of the factors, of course, leading to the increased stress. So he's done a lot of research on that, and that's a very brief summary of his work. But I was also interested in a report that was featured in The Guardian on Monday of this week by the Centre Forum called Aging Alone. And it was uh, pointing out that the over 85s are probably the most affected and also said that lonely adults were more likely to undergo emergency hospitalisation, which is, uh, you know, given the amount of time we spend talking about emergency hospital admissions is very significant, and also 
said lonely people were more likely to have early admission to residential and nursing care. So clearly, this has great ramifications, this issue, not just for individuals' physical and mental health, but for the whole health and uh, care uh, system. Now, um, Margaret McDougall quoted the VNA board report about major gaps in services for over older people. I've not got time to go into the, that whole issue of people who have identifiable mental health conditions, because in a previous mental health debate, we uh, explored the, the, the fact that services for people with clinical depression, for example, older, are not so readily available as for younger people. So that's one dimension. But today, we're concentrating more on the generality uh, of uh, older, uh, of older uh, uh, people. And the answer, as the Centre Forum uh, put it, is to, to combating loneliness lies in the community. And that, of course, is where all the volunteering is so absolutely central. The Be Enabled report talks about regular face-to-face -face contact being crucial. And can I just mention two initiatives in my own constituency from the Pulmeni Development Project in Leith. One is a group on older men's uh, health and well-being, which has been running for several years, and I've visited it myself and heard from particular men saying what a big difference that's made to their lives. But there's also, uh, they also participate in Community Connecting, which is a project funded by the Change Fund, credit to the Scottish Government for that, uh, for over 65s who are isolated, and that involves befriending, and the befriender goes with the individual to various activities in the community. So it's a, a limited period, maybe six months with the befriender, trying to introduce them to various activities uh, in the uh, community, trying to find uh, a more long-term sustainable uh, solution to their loneliness. My time's nearly up, but I should also mention uh, Age, uh, Age Scotland that I mentioned at the beginning, because they've got two initiatives, probably a lot more. Firstly, their silver line. Telephones are not as good as face-to-face -face contact, but they're certainly better than not having anything. And also, of course, uh, Age Scotland have 850 uh, member groups. So the more that we can create activities uh, and connections for older people in the community, the more this problem will be solved. Thank you. Um, I now call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can, can I begin by congratulating Margaret McDougall on securing this valued valuable debating time for what is clearly an important but perhaps overlooked issue, the impact of loneliness on physical and mental health. Mental health is the one aspect of our own health that most of us are guilty of ignoring and neglecting, assuming that our brain will never let us down and needs no care or attention to ensure it functions as it should. In view of this falsehood, I've always been hugely supportive of campaigns and organisations which raise awareness of mental health issues and seek to assist those in need of information or assistance regarding their own mental health or that of someone they care for. Whilst the stigma of mental illness is being challenged and the public are becoming more aware of the conditions affecting us, understanding how our mind works and how to keep it healthy remains minimal. Reducing alcohol consumption and keeping an active mind through learning, reading or physical activity remain important lifestyle choices and techniques to ensure the maintenance of good mental health. However, it's clear that the issue of loneliness and the impact on our mental well-being is a matter which is sometimes and somewhat disregarded. The Scottish Association for Mental Health uh, offers a five ways to better mental health guide on their website. Top of that list is stay connected. This prominence is evidently warranted, with a litany of studies showing that loneliness and social exclusion are directly linked to a number of mental health problems, including anxiety, depression, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And as we have already heard from a number of members uh, this evening, uh, also has a severe impact on physical health. And as Margaret McDougall pointed out in her motion, loneliness is disproportionately felt by older people in our society. There are a variety of reasons for this. For example, the death of a partner or close friend, as uh, Mary Scanlon touched on, or retiring and leaving the working environment can cause loneliness. Indeed, simply becoming frail and finding it difficult to go out alone can cause an individual to become secluded and lonely. Of course, being alone and loneliness are quite different things, and merely being surrounded by people will not guarantee a feeling of camaraderie, connectedness or integration. However, even the smallest interaction can help us connect and interact with the world around us. Striking up a conversation with a cashier at a checkout, going along to a local football match, attending church, or even joining a slimming club, all give a sense of belonging and allow us to feel connected to the community, help us feel more grounded, and offer a perspective on issues in our lives. 
Of course, it's important to remember that loneliness does not only cause mental illness in some people. All too often, those who struggle with mental illness feel stigmatised or are excluded from social activities, thus exacerbating their pre-existing condition. It's therefore clear that we must also ensure that those with mental health issues are not marginalised or allowed to feel that they cannot participate and be active and effective members of the community, sports team or volunteer groups. There are a variety of groups and facilities across communities in Scotland open to those looking to meet new friends and interact with their neighbours and surroundings. Indeed, when I carry out my surgeries in Beath Community Centre, a group of around eight older men and women could be found playing carpet bowls in the main hall next door, usually laughing raucously while I'm trying to address constituents' concerns. While this group spends a few pounds between them to play bowls in a local hall, there are other more structured groups, such as Garnet Valley Allotment Association, which to my mind perfectly exemplifies the idea of community engagement interaction. With dozens of members, young, not so young and old, working together to grow fresh produce and improve their community environment, all whilst managing to keep fit and healthy, learn new skills and make new friends. I don't think there can be any doubt that the more people we can encourage to become involved in groups like this, the better. Indeed, in my visits to the allotments, some of the older people suggested that if it weren't for the allotments, they would be at home, on their own, watching daytime television, and one of two of them taking antidepressants to boot. Whilst progress has undoubtedly been made in tackling the stigma and improving treatment, mental illness and maintaining mental good health remains hugely misunderstood subjects, and loneliness is at the forefront of that. As such, I would again like to congratulate the member for raising this matter and giving us the opportunity to discuss uh, these matters and what is becoming and a very interesting debate. Many thanks. And finally, before I call the Minister, Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I also want to add my congratulations to Margaret McDougall for securing this debate. It's a really important issue and we need to tackle it. Um, loneliness is not only distressing, but it can impact on people's mental and physical health, as we've already heard. Therefore, addressing it is actually preventative spend. Loneliness is more pronounced in older people, and it can be, that can be for a variety of reasons. Decreasing mobility, loss of ability to drive in rural areas, or indeed bereavement. Bereavement at any age is difficult, but for someone who has spent most of their life with someone else who has passed away, who was no longer active themselves and was dependent on that individual for company, the impact can be absolutely catastrophic not only due to grief, but also due to the loss of the company. And sometimes that person might have been the only person that they had for social interaction. Esther Ranson, who was instrumental in setting up Silverline, eh, talked in the Parliament recently and told us about how she wrote of her own lo loneliness following bereavement. She's an active, well-connected person who was devastated by the loss of her husband. When her article was published, she was absolutely inundated with correspondence from others who'd experienced extreme loneliness, and this prompted her to work along with others to set up Silverline. Silverline provides a telephone and online befriending and advice service for older people, and it's proved a lifeline to many. And Mary Scannon mentioned in her speech the, the importance of befriending services, mentioning those in Inverness, and I think that's what makes Silverline so important. Often the volunteers themselves benefit from providing the service because it gives them a purpose and creates friendships for them as well. And we've got an untapped army of volunteers in our older generations. People who are looking for purpose, have a huge amount of knowledge and also have the ability to help others. Um, and we need to tap into that resource because a telephone line is an excellent resource but many other organisations have also been trying to tackle this issue and need volunteers to support them. It's extremely important that people enjoy a social life and it becomes harder as mo mobility diminishes. Um, I was speaking recently to the Bad Nochanstra Bay Community Transport Company and they recognise uh, this and organise outings for their client groups such as Fish Teas. And Maggie Lawson was explaining to me uh, one of the client's reactions when pulling her curtains one cold winter night when it was getting dark really early, beginning to feel quite depressed, suddenly remembered she was going to be picked up in an hour or so to go out for a fish tea and actually went with a spring in her step. She had something to look forward to in the evening and didn't feel so isolated and alone. And in a way, you can't really attach a cost to that because it gets people out of the house, meeting others and also enjoying a meal. And this will improve 
improve health and well-being and also keep people more mobile and active. And it's really sad that organisations such as this are finding their funding under threat. And if they lose that funding, that service will end. If that happens, the price to the public purse will be enormous, picking up the pieces of the physical and mental health problems eh, that people develop as they become more and more isolated. Isolation is a big problem in the Highlands and Islands where people live in remote rural communities. And this is even more so for women, because they tend to live longer, they are much more likely to be bereaved. They are also of the generation that are less likely to drive. Because of cuts to local authority budgets, things like lunch clubs and community car schemes are closing and service provision is being focused on meeting need rather than prevention. It's a false economy because people will be in need of much greater intervention much sooner without those more social interactions. However, for many of our elderly, their only social contact will be their home carer. Their time with clients is also being slashed to a point where they're no, more, no longer able to help them to get to the toilet, far less to sit and chat and see how they are. We need to think, rethink how we deal with loneliness and how we prevent it. And I'm very grateful to Margaret for bringing forward this debate that allows us to highlight and indeed explore those issues. Many thanks. And I now invite Michael Matheson to respond to the debate, Minister, in around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Can I, like others, uh, offer my congratulations to Margaret McDougall in securing time for this debate? And I've listened with real interest to the contribution that members have made uh, this evening. Uh, loneliness is a, a, a complex uh, emotional response to isolation or to a lack of companionship or a, a lack of a wider uh, social network that many people can just take for granted. And it's it usually uh, also involves uh, anxious feelings and can uh, even result in anxiety when individuals are actually surrounded by other individuals uh, as well. And all of us are likely to experience uh, a period of loneliness at some point in our own uh, uh, life. And although loneliness in itself is not a, a, a mental health condition, uh, it is a, a factor that can contribute to the cause of ill health but it's also a fact that loneliness can also be caused by someone's ill health in itself. So it's both got a causal uh, effect for those who uh, may not already have an ill health, uh, but can develop one as a result of the uh, uh, problems with loneliness uh, that are associated with loneliness. And also uh, loneliness can be caused by someone's uh, ill health, whether it be physical or mental ill health. And we are aware of the research that, um, uh, that uh, has been referred to uh, tonight by Mary Scanlon and others, uh, that loneliness and social isolation can have a significant impact on physical and mental health. And the studies have shown that people who are socially isolated can experience more stress, uh, have lower self-esteem, uh, and are more likely to have sleep problems than uh, people who have strong social networks. Uh, and all of these things have a, a negative effect on a person's general uh, well-being and can contribute to mental health and physical health problems. Uh, and it can contribute to specific conditions such as anxiety and uh, depression. Now, having recognised the impact that loneliness can have, it's important that we make sure that we have a range of services which are there to help to support individuals should they require to speak to someone to get support and Advice, and that's why we support uh, uh, the organisations such as Breathing Space in order to be there, in order to be able to get advice and support for individuals who may be lonely, experiencing low mood uh, or uh, uh, depression, so that they are able to get that first uh, stop uh, as a, a place of getting some advice and support for them. And of course, there are also other organisations such as Samaritans uh, that we support and the work that they can provide on a 24-hour basis for uh, individuals. Now, I want to turn to a specific point that I think uh, Malcolm Chisholm really hit the nail on the head with, and that was um, uh, for those members who may have considered the Ministerial Task Force on Health Inequalities, which um, I chaired uh, last year in its report, which was published uh, this year. We described what is a, a, an important concept, but one which is often overlooked and undervalued, and that is the uh, concept of social capital which is one of the four key priorities that the Ministerial Task Force on Health Inequalities has identified. 
And social capital is an important element of creating resilience within communities and also within individuals. And a key part of that social capital is the role of volunteering, the purposeful role that individuals can have within their community. Now, part of the challenge in taking forward how we build better social capital within our communities in Scotland is to move away from the tendency to think that organisations and bodies, whether it be local authorities or third sector organisations, should go in and do things in local communities for the people who live in that local community, but instead look at it from the perspective of the assets that already exist within that community and look to build those assets in order to develop the social capital within that community in itself. I saw that firsthand, for example, in Fife, in a project that has regenerated the value within a local community, not because the council or a third sector organisation has come in and run a programme or a project, but they have listened to the local community and what they see as being important to them and then engage with them in how that can be facilitated and taken forward in a way that best suits their need. And a key part of that is delivering greater, greater volunteer opportunities for those who live there and reducing the social isolation that some people can experience. And that's why I think it's an important element, not only in tackling loneliness, but it's also an important element in tackling some of the health inequalities which we face in our society that can also contribute towards loneliness in itself as well. I also want to turn to the issue of uh, older people, uh, who in particular can be at greater risk uh, from uh, loneliness, and in particular the impact that it can have on their uh, mental health. That's why within our mental health strategy, our new mental health strategy, we set out a very clear range of work that we wanted to take forward in helping to support and promote greater mental health and well-being for older uh, people. And in order to take that particular area of work uh, forward, uh, we've established a, a working group who have the specific objective of taking forward the commitments around the mental health strategy uh, around uh, older uh, people. And part of that work uh, will be to uh, focus on uh, producing a range of indicators that allow us to look at what progress can be made. And tackling things like loneliness will be an important part of that overall agenda. Now, several members have also mentioned issues such as befriending projects. There is not a national strategy on befriending. Um, uh, the reason being is because befriending sits in a whole range of already existing national strategies within our national strategy around mental health, within our reshaping care for older people. For example, my own constituency, there's a befriending project there, which is for older people to help them with their shopping, etc., but creating partnership and friendships in a way where individuals have lost that and have become socially uh, isolated. So it should be seen as part of the day in, day out business of the way in which services are actually uh, delivered. Also, uh, whilst I accept that loneliness can affect uh, physical and mental health, uh, the reverse is also true, uh, that if we tackle some of the causes of poor health, health, uh, ill health, then generally we can also help to reduce uh, those who experience uh, social isolation as well. Uh, and that's why we support projects, for example, as the uh, Community Food uh, and Health uh, Project, which is about working in low-income communities to improve access to uh, take up healthy diet, which again is an important element of this. Uh, and uh, with their expertise, we have supported a number of projects. Uh, and an example is a food chain, uh, which has now uh, been expanded to reach uh, from uh, Dumfries and Galloway to six regions right across uh, Scotland, including uh, the Glasgow branch, which opened last year uh, and was opened by my colleague uh, Alec Neal. And the food train is also uh, a grocery shopping system that's been created as well uh, through befriending and helping to support households uh, to look at how they can support older people within their own individual uh, communities. So I think the whole issue of loneliness has to be looked at in the generality of the range of different measures we're taking, whether it be mental health, reshaping care for older people, the way in which we build social capital and tackling health inequalities in our community, all have a role to play in making sure that this issue is sufficiently addressed. And I hope members will be assured that we recognise the importance of this issue and we are determined to make sure that the measures we can take forward and our policy areas will help to support and addressing some of the problems which are caused with loneliness in our society today. Many thanks. That concludes Margaret McDougall's debate on recognising the impacts of loneliness and on physical and mental health. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.